Come on, let's open up our Bibles. Today I'm going to be preaching on stepping into your miracle. I made a statement earlier when we started the service, and I believe this with all my heart. God wants us to live in a natural world in a supernatural way. That's why he taught us how to pray. In this church, Wednesday nights, it's predominantly a prayer night. We worship and we pray. Occasionally, I might preach. Very little. But we pray. We teach how to pray. We practice praying. Because God's will in heaven will never be done on earth until there are good people who pray the change on earth. Stepping into your miracle. I believe that to step into miracles, what God had to do with me was change my mindset. He had to change my thinking. He had to route out some religious thinking, things that really weren't correct. They were written as ink on a page, but they, the interpretation never really conveyed the heart or the spirit of God. And so some of the things I'm going to touch today, i got three points. Some of the things I want to touch are to put spirit to the ink on the page so that we don't read it as black and white letters, but we read it through the heart and the character of who God is. There's a big difference. Can I get an agreement? Number one, I want you to know that Satan has his own secret service. He has his own SS. Hitler had his SS, secret service. And uh, they did his bidding. Satan has a secret service, and it works on spiritual sabotage. Everybody say spiritual sabotage. And the very thing that the SS, Satan's SS service does, is they set out to sabotage the character of God. They set out to sabotage our perception of God. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to read from 7 to 12. I want you to catch the heart of what Jesus is saying. Here he is. He knows that the stuff he says is going to get written down in the Gospels. He knew these four guys, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were going to re remember this by the Holy Ghost, and they're going to put these words down. So what Jesus says here, he wasn't just saying for the benefit of the people who were hearing him in the moment. He was saying it for the benefit of you and me. And Jesus says, ask, and it will be given you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Now notice it says seek, it doesn't say sit on your lounge chair and hope it'll just show up. It says seek, and you will find, knock, and the door will be opened to you. I want to tell you that if the creator of this universe tells me to ask and it will be given to me to seek and I will find and a knock and he'll end up opening the door. If the creator of the universe is saying that to Rob Scarallo, then the least that Rob Scarallo can do is to believe that the creator of the universe is going to do exactly what he said. For everyone who asks, everyone. You see, that's that grace thing. It takes you from where you are. It doesn't care about your past. It doesn't care about your mistakes. It doesn't care about your failures. Heck, I've had God answer prayers for me even when I, my life wasn't up to scratch in the then and there. 
If your life's always got to be up to scratch for God to show up, then it's not grace, it's earned. Come on, turn to somebody and say, he just got me. It's grace. Now, I'm not advocating that we live like a bunch of uh, ungodly, unsaved, motley crew. No. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so and let the redeemed of the Lord live so. I'm not about abusing the grace of God. But I'm not always on my game and sometimes my game needs some help and when my game needs some help, I need to know that the grace of God will still answer my desperate prayers. Are you with me? Amen. It says, for everyone who asks, I don't care what color you are, I don't care what nationality you are, I don't care what tongue you talk, I don't care what shape you come in. For everyone who asks, let me remind you, this is the creator of the universe. The guy who put these awesome, magnificent, phenomenally big planets in the sky. He scattered them like a little boy scatters marbles. He says, for everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Let's go to the next couple of verses. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And then he says, and we hardly ever quote this part when we read this scripture, so in everything, do to others what you would have them to do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. You know what? This is all about character. He's talking about God's character, and then he's talking about our character. And he's saying, so do to others what you would have them to do to you. Isn't it funny? Do to others what you'd have them to do for you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And he says that right after he says, ask, and it shall be done. He says that, and some religious minds think, yeah, but he won't really do it. And then he tacks on, do to others what you want done for yourself. I mean, God would have to be absolutely hypocritical. To not want to bless us, to not want to do miracles, to not want to do the impossible when we need the impossible to be done. He'd have to be a blatant, hardened, callous liar to give us an example and say, if your son needs bread and he asks for food, or if he asks for drink because he's really thirsty and you would give it to him, how much more your father in heaven would? He'd have to be a blatant, hardened liar to use an example like that and then say, well, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if I feel like doing a miracle for you today. He'd have to be a jerk to one minute tell us to do to others what we'd have them to do to us and then him backstab us and lie and, and, and negate his promise, what he just said. If God's going to tell me to do to others what I want them to do to me, he won't tell me to do that unless he is the epitome of that himself. Amen. Did you hear me? Because God ain't like some religious folk who tell us to do stuff that they don't even do. God ain't like that. You see, spiritual sabotage. Let me share a little story with you. I've never shared this publicly before, but I'm going to share it today. My mom, even when my dad was still alive, told us a story about how she um, had broken up with a guy she had been dating for about four years. It didn't work out, and so she went to Italy with her dad for a trip, my grandpa. 
escorted my mom to Italy. And here were all these young Italian guys looking at this fine Italian American laced woman. She walked like a lady. She talked like a lady. She looked a little different. And some of the homegrown, she had some of those finer touches that the advancements in America afforded. My dad caught her eye and she caught his eye. And so it soon got known that Alfonso Scarallo, everybody say Alfonso. My father's the original Fonzie. <laughs> and there was another Italian guy, we'll just call him a dude. There was some other Italian guy who fancied my mom too. And he started a rumor. And he made sure this rumor got back to my mother. And the rumor was, you don't want to marry Alfonso because he's impotent. He can't have kids. I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> I am my father's honor. The very existence of me restores his reputation. Come on. But this guy spread a rumor and wanted to sabotage my father's image. He wanted to rob my mother of the opportunity of having me and my brothers. He wanted to rob my father and my mother of the joy of their potential relationship in Christ with each other. And so he sabotaged my father's reputation, and my mother was wise enough to go to her uncle who lived in that town, went to the same church, and she said, you know, I, I sort of like this young man, but these are the rumors I'm hearing. And my uncle put it to rest. He said, trust me, sweetheart, that is a good young man. He got saved. We saw the change in his life. And he is a preacher and often goes to the neighboring towns and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the enemy wants to sabotage God's character. When I look at a verse like this, God is emphatically stating something about who he is. He said, if you know how to do decent stuff, even though we're tainted with a sin nature, and yet if somebody's hurting, We'll go, and, and, and we do kind things. We do good stuff for our kids. And God is saying, if you will do that, and you know you're all tainted with sin, we're all tainted with sin. Come on, generosity doesn't flow out of us 24-7. Sometimes people ask me for stuff, and my attitude in my head, I try not to let it come out of my mouth. Suck wind. Sometimes I have enough trouble getting my own stuff. Go get your own. <laughs> and then the grace of God touches my human nature and a little bit more of Jesus starts to come out. And then, hopefully, is when I open my mouth. But you see, the devil wants to sabotage the character of God. And there are a lot of Christians today who believe that God will do good stuff for somebody else, but they're not always sure God will do good stuff for them. And I want to tell you right now that if you're going to step into your miracle, you've got to step into the reality of what God is really like. He's a good God. He's a good God. And He loves giving us good things. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Amen. Amen. Point number two, the sovereignty of God. I hear religious people talking about the sovereignty of God. Well, God is sovereign. He could do whatever he wants whenever he wants. The king of England is sovereign in the old days. Before England was governed more by parliament, the king is more of a, and the queen are more figureheads now, the monarch. But in the old days, the king, well, the king is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. He can change his mind whenever he wants. God is sovereign. He created 
this universe. And he could do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, but guess what? God has chosen to tie himself to integrity. He has chosen to tie himself to steadfastness and stability. He has chosen to tie himself to his word. And so when God gives his word, he submits his sovereignty to his overall character. Otherwise, you never know what the schizo's going to do next. And God ain't no schizo. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But God binds himself to his word, and God binds himself to a righteous and just character. And he will never do anything that's out of order with that. Amen. Good girl, you keep clapping. They'll get it. Go on, keep clapping. They'll catch on. What's your name? I'm Denine. Denise? Denine. Denine? Good girl. You can clap anytime. Just wait for my cue. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, Denine. Matthew chapter 6. Now, I sort of quoted this a couple of times today. Again, I want to mess with your head because it's religious thinking that stops us from stepping into miracles. Now, I'm not talking about miracles as some fancy thing just to get you all excited. Listen, the God of this world right now is Satan and soon all the enemies of our God will be put under Jesus' feet. The title of ownership over the earth is going to change right now. We live in the kingdom of God, which is behind enemy lines, and the rights of that kingdom are mine because I live within a kingdom within a kingdom. Amen. The God of this world is Satan. Jesus sees, or the disciples see Jesus doing all of these miracles, and they said, teach us how to pray. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Stop. You see, when people are contemplating whether or not God's going to heal them, sometimes there's this religious thinking that says, well, God's sovereign. If he wants to heal me, he will. Maybe he doesn't want to. Too late. He already let it out of his mouth, and he's bound by his word. Good character is bound by their word. Hello? Yes. Too late. He is sovereign, but he submits his sovereignty to sensible things and things that have character and mor morality. And a person who sticks to his word is upright. People say, well, God's sovereign, you know. I mean, if it's your will, if you want to. He already said it's his will. Jesus already died by his stripes. We are healed. It is his will. It's always his will. Is that you, Deneen? I didn't even give you the cue. You can come back again. How many times have you been here now? Your first time. You're audacious. First time and you're already clapping? Good girl. Everybody clap Deneen. That's how you do it, babe. Good girl. You see, there's this religious mix-up about the sovereignty of God. Well, you know, God could do whatever he wants. He's the potter with the clay, and if he wants to just smash us against the wall, he will. No, he spoke. And he said, it's his will that whosoever will believe shall be saved. And he will always bring his sovereignty in subjection to his word. Do you know what the Bible says in the book of Psalms? It says God honors his word above his name. Amen. Part of his title is sovereign. He is the sovereign God. But he honors his word above his name. God already spoke. It's his will to do a miracle in your life when you need a miracle. Somebody say, good preaching, Pastor Rob. Now say, thank you, Jesus. 
Because it wouldn't be good preaching if it wasn't for thank you, Jesus, right? Can I make another observation here? Let's put on our, that, that, that religious thinking. If God is so sovereign like religious minds want to say, and, well, he does whatever he wants when he wants, then why does he need help for us to pray, hey, God, come on, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He don't need my help to pray that. If he's sovereign, his will's being done whenever, wherever, however. But he tells us to pray this because the will of God isn't being done on earth the way it is in heaven. You know why? Because way back when, he gave man the power to choose life or death. And despite the consequences, he submits his sovereignty to his word because he is faithful. Are you hearing me? That's why you and I need to pray, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Break the curse. Come on. I know it's broken on the cross, but I just declare this curse is broken over me and my house. Your will's going to happen to my unsaved son. Your will's going to happen to my unsaved daughter. I'm speaking in a being. Could you imagine a sovereign God who does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, and doesn't have to give account to anybody asking the church, please pray that my will gets done? Don't make sense, does it? Not at all. Changing our mindset. You know, you don't hear many stories in the Gospels of the Pharisees or the Sadducees receiving miracles at Jesus' hand. You know why? Because their mindsets were some of the hardest to change. It takes religious thinking to make stinking thinking. And sometimes God's got to change our religious thinking and free us up from some religious devils. Dare I be bold enough to ask for an amen? amen. <laughs> Point number three. Hovering between two opinions. James chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. Pastor Haas, Will, can you guys start to get communion ready? We're going to go straight into communion. It's all part of the sermon today. Hovering between two opinions, James chapter 1, starting with verse 5 to 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, who? The leaders of the church. If any of you lacks wisdom, who? Well, just those who have to minister. If some little mama who's now a widow, some single mom, some dad, anybody in the church, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all. To all. Can you read the address on that envelope? It says, to all. When mail is addressed to me, the post office will do its darndest to make sure it comes to me. God addressed that, and he said to all. I think he's a little bit better at delivering the United Postal. Hello? If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It doesn't mean he can't find fault. It means he refuses to look for fault. Why? Because it comes back to grace. God's unmerited favor. He doesn't look at your performance. God knows that if he did, you and I would never get anything. He looks at his performance, and his performance is always grace. He responds to us with unmerited favor, undeserved. I can't earn it. It says he gives to all without finding fault, and it will, and it will. It's not enough that he addressed it. He then 
reiterates it and says, and it will be given to you. Listen, that's the kind of Bible I'm reading. This is all about the character of God. And God's character doesn't change when I'm the one in need. God's character doesn't change when you're the one in need. You're not going to get a miracle because you're good enough. You're going to get a miracle because God is good enough. And it will. I like that. And it will, Sandy, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, there's a but, uh uh-huh. There's always a but somewhere. There's always a butthead somewhere. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Let's go to verse 7. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Do you know that when we doubt, we negate the address on the envelope? Could you imagine writing out a birthday card to somebody you love dearly and you get to the address And you start wavering between two opinions. Should I send it or shouldn't I send it? Should I send it to the intended or should I send it to Johnny? You start to waver between two opinions. The intended isn't going to get it. Johnny isn't going to get it. Heck, the postal service will never even see it because it's never been labeled and addressed. And God has a but. You got to not doubt. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable. Stop. You know what God calls a person who hovers between two opinions and can never get out of the rut? He calls them unstable. Isn't it funny? Look how the devil's secret service works to spiritually sabotage the character of God. God has spoken his will. The word of God is filled with his promises. Over 700 different categories of promises. The word of God spells out the promises of God. And then we, with our religious minds, read those promises black and white. We say, well, God, if it's your will. Yo, according to God's description, when you're constantly hovering between two opinions and you can't make up your mind, you is unstable. And we virtually call God unstable. He is mentally unstable. When we're questioning whether or not it's his will and he's already spoken it in his word. I want to tell you, my daddy is not incompetent mentally. He is not unstable. It is his will. It is his will. It is his will. And his yes means yes. God's description. A person who can't make up their mind and is constantly hovering between two opinions. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Oh, he loves me. I heard from God today. 24 hours later, I don't think God even knows I exist. God's opinion is, hey, you're a little bit unstable. You know, in the Greek, it says a double-minded man. In the Greek, it literally means a person with two different minds. You can't hover between two opinions and get the envelope addressed to the right party. Faith is making up your mind. Does God want to heal me or not? Oh, but I'm not good enough. That's right, you're not. I'm not but he's going to heal us anyway. He's going to bring a breakthrough anyway. You see, why is this stuff important? 
Because all through the Gospels, I hear this phrase from Jesus, according to your faith. What you expect from me is exactly what you're going to get. And if you expect nothing, according to your faith. According to your faith. You know what faith is? It's a judgment about the character gone. Some people might say, well, you know, Pastor Rob, he's a real faith preacher. No, actually, faith to me is a lot more than a formula to how to get a miracle to happen. Faith to me is about a relationship with somebody that I absolutely can count on. Amen. That's what faith is. It's relationship. I can count on him. I can count on him. I can count on him when my back is to the wall and a doctor who is aged, and he comes in and he says to my daughter, my son-in-law, your baby's going to be dead in the morning. And I've preached the power of God and the promises of God, and I got my family looking to me. We're partying, we're eating, we got balloons, we're having fun. And this doctor comes and he wants to rain on our party. You know what I made him do? I made him stand with us, I made him hold our hands, and I asked him, do you believe in miracles? And then when he says, well, I don't know, I says, well, we do. Now hold our hands, we're going to pray. When your back's to the wall, you got to know that God isn't in the game of constantly changing his mind. Well, let's see if it's my will today. The promises of God are yes in Christ. Every time I look at the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus is saying, yes! But he died there. He was whipped. He was wounded. He was in agony. That's right. His pain is our gain. And while he was in pain, all of heaven and all of hell was hearing the Son of God say, Yes! For humanity. The promises of God are many and they are always yes in Jesus Christ. And the amen has to be spoken by the church. And you know what amen means? It means that's exactly how it's going down. That's how it's going to be. You see, when you say amen, you just went from hovering from two opinions to one opinion. That's how it's going to be. We're going to take communion. Would you stand? Musicians, would you come? Ushers, would you start to hand out communion? If you've asked Jesus Christ in your heart, and communion's for you, It doesn't matter whether you've had your best week. This is not a reward session. Communion is a reminder. I was a sinner. Sometimes I mess up, but I am saved by grace. And because I believe it, faith will take me to where I've never been. 